In this last section of chapter seven, we are going to start to talk about chronic pain versus acute pain and different types of pain. So um, table 7.4 in the book um, list, compares the characteristics of acute versus chronic pain. And I also have this table in the module. It's the same table, just different font. <laughs> so we're, we'll go over it. Um, but it's a, a good thing to know the um, characteristics of acute versus chronic pain. So um, it goes by cause, what the client reports, the function, um, and the consequences. So with acute pain, the cause is the threat or um, the, the threat of tissue damage or actual tissue damage can cause acute pain. So you can still get acute pain with no tissue damage, but it, it, the threat of tissue damage or actual tissue damage. Chronic pain um, can have continuing tissue damage or environmental factors. You're conditioned to perceive pain in a certain situation. That's the operant conditioning. Sensitization of nociceptive pathway neurons or dysfunction of endogenous pain control systems. Those all can cause chronic pain. Um, with acute pain, the client reports a clear description of location, pattern, quality, frequency, and duration. With chronic pain, it's a vague description. So um, pain can be diffuse, it can be moving around, it's not the same pattern. Um, a lot of times we'll ask people what relieves their pain, what causes their pain, and with chronic pain, it's a vague description. It can be anything. Um, with acute pain, um, function is really it's a acute pain is a warning of tissue damage and it enforces rest of the healing tissue so it affects our function that way so um, antalgic gait is a, is a functional result of acute pain um, with chronic pain um, if the tissue damage isn't continuing there's no biological benefit to change in function but there might be a social or psychological benefit so someone may um, benefit in some social or psychological way, um, like they get attention or they um, uh, it changes their uh, employment status or something. There's some other benefit for the pain to continue. Secondary gain. So the consequences of acute pain are excessive autonomic activity, excessive endoneurocrine activation, or neuroendocrine activation, um, if acute pain is not adequately treated, it can be as harmful as any disease and it may progress to chronic pain. So that is a, that is a pretty salient point for physical therapy is if we can address acute pain, if we can address pain in the acute stage um, with education, with modalities, with exercise, however we're going to do it, we can actually prevent it from moving into chronic pain. So the consequences of chronic pain can be severe financial, emotional, physical, and or social stresses on the person and family. There can be um, physiological consequences of inactivity causing other problems. In pathology last quarter, we talked about the physiological consequences of inactivity. It's terrible for you. Um, what, what we like to say is sitting is the new smoking. In other words, if you're sitting around, you're doing more damage to your body than if you were out there smoking a cigarette. So um, chronic pain can have severe consequences for the patient. So we're going to start to distinguish between nociceptive chronic pain and neuropathic chronic pain. So we're going to talk about nociceptive chronic pain here, and then as we go into Chapter 8, we're going to talk about uh, neuropathic chronic pain. So nociceptive chronic pain is pain that is due to continuing stimulation of nociceptive receptors. For example, chronic pain that results from a vertebral tumor pressing on nociceptors in the meninges surrounding the spinal cord. There's continual stimulation of nociceptive receptors. The neurons are functioning normally. Chemical changes in the damaged tissue awaken sleeping peripheral nociceptors. So in chapter four, we talked about silent synapses and how they get activated. Um, silent synapses in peripheral nociceptors get activated by changes in damaged tissue. 
So this is no susceptive chronic pain. You might not be able to change it because you have a tumor, but um, it, it's caused by no susceptive input. You're, you're getting stimulation of no susceptors. Um, primary hyperalgesia. So alge um, algesia is from the Greek root for pain. Hyper is more. Um, so primary more pain or hyperalgesia refers to the excessive sensitivity to stimuli in, the, in, in injured tissue. So pain resulting from mild heat on burned skin. So they give the example of the fingertip being burned, picking up a hot plate, being more painful than if the skin wasn't injured. Um, another one that I think probably a lot of us have experienced is you get a sunburn. And you're, you think you're feeling a little bit better, and you think, I'm going to take a warm shower. You get in there, and it feels scaldingly hot. Your tissue is more sensitive to the stimulus of the warm shower. And uh, probably while you're still sunburned, you might want to take a cool shower. But it's that hypersensitivity to stimuli in the injured tissue. No, no susceptive chronic pain serves a useful biological function as a warning to protect injured tissue. Um, when we start to talk about neuropathic chronic pain, um, it does not serve a useful biological function because um, we might not have injured tissue. So um, in terms of chronic pain terminology, primary hyperalgesia is one of the definitions I want you to know. Um, we will talk about, um, when, in chapter eight, when we're talking about neuropathic chronic pain, we will talk about um, three other definitions that I want you to know, and they are in the um, study uh, objectives. So no susceptive chronic pain, you have um, continuous stimulus to no susceptors, so there is no susceptor stimulation going on, and it serves a useful biological function as a warning to protect the injured tissue.